Okay, hello, hello. We are going over database normalization today. First thing, so this is, uh, what lecture is this? This is lecture number 6B, if you're downloading the PowerPoint. So if you don't like to watch it on the big screen, you can watch it on your little screens. Lecture number 6B, and it is normalization of database tables, which goes along with one of your assignments. Hello? I know I have a mic right now, but I'm still hearing everybody talking. Okay, thank you. So just a, it's a little bit easier, then I don't feel like I have to yell over you. All right, so database normalization is the topic for this morning. We'll do some database normalizing right now, and then we will uh, I'll go over the assignment that deals with this, and then we'll have lunch, and then we'll do something else in the afternoon. So if you have database normalization questions, this is the time to ask them during the lecture. I'm going to go over all of the different transitions from first normal form to second normal form to third normal form, et cetera. Uh, so hopefully you'll find this um, lecture interesting. Hello. Okay, so what is database normalization? It is making the database in a form in which it can be used for applications, as I've talked about yesterday, or it can be used in terms of maintaining consistency in the database within the tables themselves, uh, getting rid of duplicate data, making the database itself last longer, not um, get as corrupted or as, as malfunction. Um, and you know, basically it also ensures the correctness of the data <clears throat> because you're relying upon this database to give you answers to questions. And if you have really bad data in there and a bad structure, it's not going to give you good answers. It's going to give you wrong answers, actually. Uh, so you want it to hold good information. So what normalization is and what role it plays that we're going to be talking about today in terms of the design process, what makes something in first normal form, second normal form, third normal form, and then we have BCNF, and we have fourth normal form. We actually can have tenth normal form if you want. It stops at around three, and here's why. So most databases are in third normal form because when you start putting it into a fourth normal form, it makes it harder to use. There's a compromise between, remember yesterday I said, you know, you take all this stuff, all this data, and you're going to spread it out, and put it all over the place. Well, there's a compromise to doing that because when you do that, you make it harder to retrieve it. So fourth normal form databases are very hard to work with, very hard to query, very hard to, you know, add data to it. It's too, there's too many constraints, too much information, and then they're really hard to even write applications for. So third normal form is kind of the form in which most databases are in. If you can reach third normal form, you've got a good design. If you want, you can use the BCNF, and some people, and I'll talk about BCNF today as well, uh, some people prefer that over third normal form. You can be in third normal form and also in BCNF, or you can be in third normal form and not in BCNF. So you're in one of these, at least, to a certain level. Third normal forms also are second normal form, also are first normal form but not necessarily BCNF, and I'm going to go through all of this. So how the normal forms can be transformed from lower normal forms to higher ones in the normalization of the entity relationship diagram model being used uh, to produce a good database design. That some situations require for denormalization, so I'll talk about denormalization, which is a reality for most development stuff going on. Um, mix it from a fourth normal or from a BCNF and puts it back down into a third normal or a second normal, depending upon what it is you're trying to do. <clears throat> so let me get started with the concept of normalization. So it's the process of evaluating and correcting table structures to minimize data redundancy. So we don't want any redundancy, so instead we put in what's called controlled redundancy. All those keys that you're putting into tables fall into the category of redundancy. If you have a social security number or student ID in the student table and then you also have the same social security number or student ID in the registration table, also in the classes table, also in the history archives, you're, you're controlling it but you're introducing redundancy. So controlled redundancy is good. Uncontrolled redundancy, not good. Because if you have, let's say, the customer's address in five different places and it's redundant that way, and the customer moves, well then you've got to change it in five different places. So, you know, it's not necessarily a good thing and not all five of them are going to match probably. So it helps eliminate data anomalies when you reduce that type of redundancy. So normal forms is basically aiming at reduction of that and introducing controlled redundancy. So we take some redundancy out, we put some redundancy back in, which is kind of weird. So it works through a series of stages called normal forms. 
And there is a such thing as a first normal form. We're going to look at it in a few minutes. And then we have a second normal form, and then we have a third normal form, which I'm going to go over. Second normal form is a better version of the first. Third is a better version of the second. And for most database designs, the third is the highest you're going to need to go to in the normalization process. And the highest level is not always the most desirable level for the reasons I've given you so far. And most of the reasons primarily is makes it harder to do queries on the tables, <clears throat> harder to find data in the tables, <clears throat> and then it requires too many joins. And, and, and when that happens, you're lowering the efficiency or the speed in which the database is actually um, running at to a certain point. So the higher the normal form, the slower and less efficient the data access actually becomes in nature. So higher is not always better so in terms of the concept. So here's an example and that we'll go through. And it's related to the need for normalization. In the example, we have a company that manages building projects. So, you know, pretend like you're a consultant and you're going out to a company and they handle some building projects and we're going to take their projects for the data that they have already and put it into a database. So it charges its clients for billing hours spent on each one of the contracts. And there's an hourly billing rate that is dependent on the employee's position. So we have different employees with different positions. And periodically a report is generated that contains information that is displayed in figure 5.1. Well, that's the numbering. It came out of a textbook that was figure 5.1 sample layout report. So here's what a lot of people do, actually. They either put this in Microsoft Access or they put it in Microsoft Excel. And then they take and they put it into a database. And then they hired you. You come in and you say, well, how am I going to fix this thing? Believe it or not, this is sort of not even in first normal form yet. It's, it's not quite there yet. It's a spreadsheet. But everybody thinks a spreadsheet is a database. Okay, so you guys don't think that. Uh, but business people, they think, oh, a spreadsheet, Excel, database. I got it. Here it is right here. Put this in the database. Mm, well, okay, well, let's work it towards first normal form. So a table in the report here. So a table in a report format. We noticed some issues here. So we've taken this here, and this is going to use access, actually, as an example, because it's easier to show you the data in terms of the table structure. This is the report. They've taken the report, and they put it into Microsoft Access, because there's an import feature, actually, believe it or not, in Microsoft Access. Import Excel. Oh, here's, here's our database. So can you guys fix it? Oh, OK. Well, let's see what happens. Uh, so you notice that we have, uh, you know, like, some columns, some rows that don't have information in them, missing information. Well, yeah, this is filled in pretty good, but we have a lot of redundancy, like database designer, database designer. Oh, redundancy in there. So uh, the structure of the data does not handle data and does not handle queries very well. Uh, so the table structure appears to work. The report is generated with ease, which is why people do this, actually. And then they print it out and they go, oh, look, see, it's in the database. And unfortunately, the report may yield different results depending upon what data anomaly has occurred. What kind of query are they running on this? And Microsoft Access allows you to run queries on this, believe it or not. And this is a legal access database table. So what we're going to do is we're going to convert it to first normal form. So let's just get it into first normal form to start out with. We have repeating groups. This is what's called a repeating group. You know, where it says project number, we have 15, 6, 18, 22, 25. These are groups that are repeating. So you have to get rid of the repeating groups to put it into first normal form. So it derives its name from the fact that the group of the multiple related ent ent entries can exist for any single key attribute occurrence. So that definition doesn't really, I don't know. It's like not as clear as what I just said a few minutes ago when I showed you the report, but... Um, so in a relational table, you must not contain any repeating groups. So normalizing the table structure will reduce the data redundancy. Normalization is a three-step procedure. So number one, we're going to eliminate the repeating groups. So if you're asked what first normal form means, it means there's no repeating groups. So traditionally, it's taking the spreadsheet and fixing it. So you've got the repeating groups uh, taken care of. So the present data in the tabular format uh, where each cell has a single value and there's no repeating groups. So we eliminate those repeating groups uh, by eliminating nulls, making sure that each repeating group attribute contains an appropriate data value. And here it is. What do we do? We took this 15 and we filled it in. 
We got, so if you want to think no repeating groups means getting rid of the blanks visually, but it's really a bad, hard way of describing that. <laughs> you can't say, if I asked you what are repeating groups, and you said, it gets rid of the blanks, doesn't necessarily answer the question right. But repeating groups by concept means filling in values for cells that are supposed to be null because there's no value in there because the data was put in missing information. But it's not really missing information. It was grouped. It was so it was grouped by, you know, and the groups repeated themselves, which is that format of a spreadsheet. Anyway, so I hope you get the concept of what a repeating group is, maybe by these examples. But long story short, we filled in all the information, so each column has a value. That's actually first normal form. So this is not first normal form. That's a spreadsheet. <laughs> so to make it into a database. To put it into first normal form, the only thing we have to do is get rid of the repeating groups. So everyone can probably create a first normal form database, no problem. I mean, all you have to do is put some junk in there. Just make sure you have something in each one of the cells. You have a first normal form. Not going to do very much for us. So instead what we're going to do is identify some primary keys in step number two. So the primary key must be uniquely identified attribute value. So no key must be a new key must be composed if no key exists. So we're going to look at the dependencies. And so normalization is all about identifying dependencies on the data and reducing partial dependencies, taking those partials and making them full dependency, and then get rid of looping dependencies or dependencies that are there, but they don't, you know, like transient dependencies, they don't belong there. Or there are multiple dependencies that are messing up the integrity of the data. And I'll talk about those as we go to second to third normal form. But identifying all of the dependencies is really the next, uh, well, the third step according to the slide, but it's really the next kind of component that you're looking at. In terms of a dependency diagram, this is why you do the entity relationship diagramming. So if you have an entity relationship diagram that you've created for your database design, you're going to actually automatically create third normal form databases with that. So you don't actually have to go through any of this process. The unfortunate problem is, though, is nobody uses entity relationship diagrams. Nobody out there feels like, oh, you know, that's like textbook. Why are we going to do that? So they, they go and they start out with this first normal form database instead, which is kind of ridiculous. So it used to be in the old days, in fact, in this class, we did dependency diagrams last week. Or not last week, the last time we had class, the first weekend. When the first exercise you did was a dependency diagram. That's what they used to do to put things in third normal form, then that method sophisticated changed into entity relationship diagramming. And that is a little bit better because it puts you actually into fourth or possibly fifth normal form, depending upon how many of those rules you actually enforce. And most of the rules to get into second have to do with identifying which relationships exist and which attributes are identified as the key or the candidates, which is where that word candidate came from. So candidates are identifiable keys that form dependencies between the data. So usually, you know, people go, well, a unique one would be a social security number or a student ID, but any key is a candidate as long as it depends on the information that's in the row. It depends on the, it's identifiable in terms of its dependency. So the dependency diagram depicts all the dependencies found within a given table structure, helpful for getting a bird's eye view of the relationship among the table attributes. And uses uh, makes use. Uh, the use makes it less likely that you're going to um, actually overlook any important dependencies or information as well. So here's a first normal form. And uh, this is uh, the way you're going to document normal forms in the assignment. However, you're probably not going to use purple and gold colors with boxes like this. But you can draw it out like this. So this is depicting the structure of a table. And the table is the one we just looked at, the spreadsheet. It's in first normal form right now, and it's still in first normal form. So this is a dependency diagram with these arrows going on here that are sort of like the dependency diagrams you drew, but you didn't put them all in a straight line. If you take, it, if you take all your boxes of a dependency diagram and you put them in a straight line, it's going to look like that. What is that giving you? It's giving you a first normal form table from the beginning and then you're going to identify the dependencies within the diagram. So this is a kind of a portrayal of all the possible parts 
of dependencies you might run into. What we want are full dependencies. What we're getting in here, because we're only in first normal form, we're getting partials and transitive dependencies. So let's talk about a partial dependency. Partial dependency relies on, for example, project number with a project name. Well, it's not a guarantee. That's not 100% that each project number is going to have, and we can't have multiple project names, and that they're all going to have unique project names. No, it depends on which project number as to which project name it is. So we can have project number one that's called the ITU project, and then project number two that's called the ITU project, project number three called the ITU project. Uh, can you see some possible inconsistencies? You say, okay, give me all the ITU projects but each one of them is different, but you use the same name, well then there's only a, it, it, think of this sort of like, there's only, you can only partially get the correct information. There's going to be part of it that's going to be missing in terms of your query capabilities, because you can't just say, give me the one for the mic install. Say, so what project was that? Oh, so it's an IT project. Okay, then you have to go, well, which project number? So then, then you have to get it from IT project, then you got to go back the project number to get that one that might be someone made a note somewhere that that's about this project. So it's not full, it's partial in terms of its dependency. Also, there we have a dependency here in terms of the employee number that might be working on a project number that might have a project name. So employee number five could be working on project number one for the IT project. Employee number uh, six could be working on project number one for the employee ID number. So, so we're going to have problems getting at the full information because we have a partial kind of loop thing going on here. Or we also have a partial dependency over here where we have multiple dependencies all relying upon the same partial. So we have an employee number and then we have an employee name. But we might have another entry down here that says employee number with a different employee name. Uh-oh, that's going to be a problem. So actually we have a student in here that has two student IDs tells me that we have partial. If you're able to be a student at ITU and he can have two student IDs, there's a partial dependency in that database in the EMS that allows a student to have more than one ID. So there's no, it, it's not broken out. It, actually I'd call this possibly a second normal form database. Could be second normal form if it includes it could include a transitive dependency. What does a transitive dependency mean? It means the job class and the changed, a charged hours might change. So in order to figure out, for this particular employee, in order to figure out the, his pay rate, we have to look at his job class. But then we also have this problem here where the job class relies upon the changed hours that's entered in here. Other people with the same job class might have different hours. Sometimes you want that, sometimes you don't want that. So it's kind of like how you can have a student in here. How would you be able to have a student in the database with two different student IDs? Then you'd have multiple different student IDs, and you'd have either partial dependencies or you'd have a transitive dependency, which puts you into first normal form according to this. But we could be in second if we still have transitives but we don't have partials. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. So in one step, the first thing we want to do is get rid of the partials. And how do we get rid of the partials? Well, we break this out into multiple tables. So breaking it out, if we had a student table as an example, and Bob Smith was in that table, and Bob Smith has a student ID this, and another Bob Smith came in, and we'd say, oh, nope, sorry, Bob Smith's already in here. So if he had a new student ID, that student ID that was in that table would change. There's no ability to have multiple IDs associated with Bob Smith. So, but when it's like this, it's in the wrong normal form, then it's possible. We could have tons of Bob Smiths in here with tons of student IDs. No problem, actually, uh, because of the partial dependency. So anyway, um, I'll continue with the partial dependency concept and a few more examples. But in terms of the tabular format and first normal form, all key attributes should be defined. So tabular format is in which all key attributes are defined. There are no repeating groups in the tables. And all attributes are dependent on a primary key. 
And this is for the first normal form. So all relational tables satisfy first normal form requirements if they meet these requirements. So on the final exam or on the assignment, I'm going to say go from first normal form to second normal form to third normal form. And I'm going to give you a bunch of tables with fields in it. And what you can do is draw it out like this and go, well, that's first normal form. It's automatically in there unless you have repeating groups and get rid of the repeating groups, actually. And then we go from first to second. Then we're going to go from second to third. So some tables might contain what's called partial dependencies, and these dependencies are based on only a part of the primary key, not the whole primary key, uh, which is what makes it part. So partial dependency is a dependency on part of the primary key, but not the whole primary key. As an example, if we don't have a student ID as a primary key, we have a partial dependency. Because we can have Bob Smith with student ID 111, and then we have Bob Smith with student ID 122, and Bob Smith with 333, and all these different partial dependent student IDs. And then we can look up each one of the partials, and we can say, oh, Bob Smith took this class. And then the other Bob Smith, he took that class. And the other Bob Smith. We have no way of putting all the Bob Smiths together until we get rid of the partial dependency. Okay, so sometimes uh, used for performance reasons, but should be used with caution. So you might put a partial dependency in there. If, for example, you are the registrar's office and you're trying to print out, um, I don't know, like um, invoices or something, um, or student rosters or something, and you needed to join two tables together, and the join was costly. Like, and all you needed to join was one little piece of information. Then you could take that one little piece of information and you're putting your table back into first normal form, but you're putting it into the wrong table on purpose to create a partial dependency to make the query run faster. So you can eliminate the join because the join is taking too much time. That was a good justification. Otherwise, not such a good idea. And if you have a join running like that, you might want to consider a different strategy in terms of your data on your table structures. Uh, still subject to data redundancies, however, as well. So let's convert it to second normal form. So the relational database here, design can be improved by converting this one to second normal form. So we have two steps to convert it to second normal form. And step number one, identify all of the key components. So write each key component on a separate line, and then write the original composite key on the last line. And then each component will become the key in the new table. And then we're going to see an example of this coming up. And then identify the dependent attributes that are associated with each key. Determine which attributes are dependent on the other attributes. And at this point, most of the anomalies have been eliminated. And we get this. So this is graphical, you know, going back to the color scheme here and the boxes and the arrows. So this is line number one. This is line number two. This is line number three. Line number one, we're writing down from the original straight line that we had. We took the straight line and we're putting it into three separate lines, breaking it out into three separate table structures. And I know I'm, I'm going to have at least one or two people are going to ask me, how do you want this documented? In the assignment, write them out. You're not going to be using purple and uh, gold colors or boxes. You can put them in boxes if you want. You can do it just like this if you want. Or you could just simply give me the attributes separated by a comma and draw the tables out just the same way as I asked you to draw them out after you did the entity relationship diagrams to convert those diagrams into a table structure. That's the same, this is the same format. But you can use, you know, curly brackets or solid brackets or boxes or lines or anything you really want, actually. So if you're taking an entity relationship diagram and you're translating it into a list of tables, you get this. This is what you get out of the entity relationship diagram. And then you have to apply that extra step to put it into third normal form, which we haven't gotten there yet. So this is really second normal form. It's second normal because we've identified key attributes. We've taken that spreadsheet now. We've divided it out. These are three different tables. So we have a table named project, employees, and assign. But you notice we still have this transitive relationship going on. We still have, even though we've, we've, we've identified attributes and we've broken it out, we haven't gotten rid of this yet. So IT database might be in second normal form depending upon, well actually it's really in first because it does have a partial dependency, but uh, we could, we could, uh, we could be here. 
and it might be implemented uh, on purpose for some reason. But uh, anyway, so the project number and the project name. So if you make the project number a key, then we can refer to projects by their number. And so we don't have to go number or name. We only have one way of getting at the project. And then the, each one of the names can be the same if we want. We don't have to worry about the association. And then we have the employee number here and the employee name. Uh, job class with charged hours. So we could have employees in here that have a job class that make different amounts of money. And this might be a desired thing to put in here. But if your job class is going to be a standard job class, like a grade A, B, C, or something, uh, you're probably going to make it cons more consistent if you want to put the consistency in here. So this doesn't enforce any business rules, which sort of makes it a transitive dependency. It's transitive because it's dependent on another field in the same table. And this field is not a primary key. This field is an attribute. So you have, when you have this type of dependency, you have what's called a transitive dependency. Um, and then we have the assigned table down here where we have uh, employee number, project number, and assigned hours that are associated with it. This could be a composite key of both of them, actually. So it's project number and employee number. So the table is in second normal form by definition if it's in first normal form and it includes no partial dependencies. We've gotten rid of that. So no attribute is dependent on only a portion of a primary key. The, all the attributes are dependent on a full, full primary key and um, we have those rules enforced. So now we want to convert it to a third normal form database. So we, the data anomalies created are easily eliminated by completing the third normal step in three steps. So number one, identify each new determinant. So for every transitive relationship or transitive dependency, write its determinant as a primary key for a new table. So what we're doing is first we're getting rid of the partials and then next we're going to get rid of those transitive relationships, transitive dependencies, I'm sorry. We do that by identifying determinant. Well, what's going to determine the relationship between all of those keys that are depending upon each other that are not defined as keys? So any attribute whose value determines other values within a row is a good definition of a transitive dependency. So you identify the attributes dependent on each one of the determinants identified in step number one, and then identify the dependency, and then name the table to reflect its contents and its function. And then remove the dependent attributes from the transitive dependency and put them in their, their own table. And we'll see that in a few minutes. So eliminate all the dependent attributes in a transitive relationship or relationships. You might actually have more than one. And then from each table that has such transitive relationships, um, remove them out of there as well. And then draw a new dependency diagram or draw a new table structure to show all the different tables that are defined in step one, two, three. And then check the new tables and modify the table from step number three to make sure that each line has, a, or each one of them has a dependent. It does not contain any inappropriate dependencies. And here we go. So we have a new, and this was created out of a concept. The concept here is going to be called, the table is going to be called job. And in the job concept, we have a class, job class with a charged hour. So all the grade A's are making $10 an hour, and all the grade B's are making $15 an hour, or however, or, you know, however the levels are working or the classes are working. This is third normal form. This is pretty good. This is what your, this is what your entity relationship diagram should be giving you after you've translated it. You might, some of them actually end up in second normal form, and then you have to look at the transitive dependencies that might not necessarily be um, clear from the diagram itself. So it doesn't put us into B, C, and F, but it does put us into third normal pretty nicely if we follow it through correctly, do some modifications on it. But third normal form, is that good enough? Hmm, well, we'll see what else we can do. So it's in third normal form if it's in second normal form and it contains no transitive dependencies. So we can improve the design even further. So in terms of the table structures themselves that are cleaned up to eliminate the troublesome Initial, partial, and transitive dependencies, which we've done so far, and then the normalization cannot by itself be relied on to make good designs. It's good structure, but it's not necessarily a good design for how it's going to be used. And um, 
So what we got down here, it's, it's valuable because it can help us eliminate data redundancies. So now we can improve a little bit further. So the following changes were made so far. We've looked at the primary key assignments, naming conventions of tables can be looked at, attribute uh, atomicity, so that we only have attributes in one table, adding attributes, adding relationships, defining primary keys that weren't there before, maintaining historical accuracy of the data, and then using derived attributes as an example um, of being able to put in a key when a key may not exist. So the completed database sort of looks like this if it was implemented in. So the completed database here we have the projects and we have the table name. And so the tables would actually look very similar to this where we have no more do we have job code. We only have one job code in here, 500, 501, 502, 503, which would be student ID for a student table or something of that nature. And then uh, on the project over here, uh, we have just the project numbers with no repeating groups and inside of the project numbers we have the project name, stuff like that. So, And uh, the other two tables for the assign and for the employee, which is kind of an interesting stretch on that. So limitations of the system assigned key. So one of the things that people like to do is make up stuff like student IDs or numbers or indexes or sequences. Um, in fact, sequences is the oracle term and index is a totally different concept uh, to be applied to a table. So system assigned keys or primary keys may not prevent uh, confusing entries. As an example, if I don't know your student ID, I have to find you some other way. So if you have multiple forms of keys in the database, you're taking yourself from third normal form and you're putting yourself back into second normal form because what you're going to do in that particular case is going to have multiple keys that all partially or transitively define things as an example. If we wanted to take and make it easier to search on students we could put social security number in there or visa number or name or email address and then also put student ID in the table. So we've gone from a third to a second to make it easier to search on it because if Bob Smith comes up and I don't know that Bob's last name, I just know he's Bob, I can't find him in that database. It's impossible to find him in that database unless he gave me a student ID. But what's the student ID going to do for me? I can't tell who you are by your student ID. Which is kind of an interesting solution. Let me give you an example of how to solve the problem, actually, with um, the Social Security number in the United States. So U.S. Social Security numbers are in three forms. The first three digits identify the state in which the number was given out in. The second two numbers identify having to do with the year sequence. There's a formula that's calculated on that that tells you exactly what year and month in which that social security number was issued. The last four digits of them were identify you in terms of the city and your um, something having to do with the alphabetical order of your last name. So the, the number itself is meaningful. The number can find you. In fact, the government has programs written that will tell you, you know, keep, they keep tracks, they keep statistics on this. You know, how many Social Security numbers were issued in California in 2012? How many, and how many for this hospital, and how many from that city, and how many? They can keep track of all that stuff because of the numbering system. So then they have reduced, because you think about Social Security number database, huge. Every single individual in the United States has one of these numbers. And it's all together for the United States. All the states are all together in the same system. It's held by the federal government. So that's a huge database. And it keeps growing every year. Because what ends up happening is people pass away, but their social security number doesn't. And they don't reuse them. They get they left in the system. So imagine after about 20 years, this thing has to be in third normal form, or fourth normal form, or fifth normal form. Because we got to be able to get at the data as quickly as possible and as it has to be structured, otherwise we're going to lose the data, and we can't lose data on Social Security numbers, otherwise people won't get their retirement, people won't get, you know, there'll be problems. So that was the solution that they came up with 
to make that database as high as normal form as possible without introducing partial dependencies or transitive dependencies. So let's go back to the ITU example I gave you earlier. We're probably in a second normal form database because instead of doing something like that, making those IDs more identifiable so we could bind you with that ID in the system, they just made random numbers out of it. And they're sequence numbers of some sort, and there's no sequence table probably, which is why people like sequences. If you put together a sequence table and you have a sequence, then you know which sequence number belongs to or was used in which table. And you can actually, in the sequence table, identify that with some personal information, let's say a social security number or another piece. So you have a lookup. So you can take the social security number, find, or the visa number, or some piece of information, the last name or something, and find through the sequence table, through the lookup, the student ID. And once you found the student ID, then you can go back in and that would be a way of fixing the second normal form, putting it into a third normal form would be to make those social, make those student IDs identifiable like the social security numbers. But I suspect what ended up happening is instead of doing something like that, what we did was we just introduced a partial or introduced a transitive relationship into the student table that said, here's a student ID, here's your name. We just put all the information in there and made it all in one table, which basically doesn't make it into a key. So those student IDs aren't keyed because more than one student can have the same ID and more students can have multiple IDs, which is not because there's been cases in which two students have had the same ID and then multiple students or one student has multiple IDs that are associated with the student. It just tells you right off the bat it's not a third normal form database. Okay, otherwise, and that's, I mean, I'm bringing this not to complain about the database. I'm bringing this up as an example of what happens in businesses, and that's a real example, actually, of what happens. And different solutions. So as a database administrator, if you're designing a system and you're looking at normal forms, those are some of the considerations. Sometimes you have to put it into a second normal form, however, to make it searchable or to make it usable for the application that it needs to be used with. So people, instead of fixing the application, they alter the database format or the structure of the database to make that more usable. So it's like the chicken before the egg. I mean, do you want to mess up the integrity of the normal form of the database so you can make the application work? Or do you want to fix the application, which might be harder to work with a more strict third normal form database without altering that database structure? So there's design considerations and things and strategies to use, but sometimes you do want to go lower. And there's nothing wrong with going into a second normal form database because otherwise the application's not going to work or something is preventing it from going into a third normal form for some strange reason. But the problem is when you walk into a business and you look at their database and it's in a second normal form for no apparent reason, <laughs> then it makes sense. We'll put it into third normal form and reformat that data, you know, dump the data out of this table and put it into all these other tables instead and fix the keys and the constraints and put all the rules in there and then everything will probably run faster and be less uh, troublesome further down the road. So. so we can take it a little bit further than that as well. So the data entries here in figure 5.2, um, which you've probably forgotten about so far, <laughs> are inappropriate because they have duplicate existing records. So in here, the original data had duplicate existing records, so there has yet been no violation of either entity integrity or referential integrity. Instead, what we end up having is duplicate existing records that might show up. And here's an example of duplicate existing records. And this happens normally when you take a database that's in second normal form and you put it into third normal form because you took the data because yeah, how are you going to do this? You're going to walk into a company and they're going to say, hey, would you look, can you optimize our database? Because our system's running real slow and we're thinking about it. There's no reason. Here's the other thing. There's no reason to replace the software. Usually the problem is with the design of the tables. I mean, Oracle is Oracle. MySQL is MySQL. Everyone thinks, oh, well, let's just replace the software. It's the software's fault. 
And then they take the same database that they had working in Oracle and they move it over to MySQL or the opposite direction and they take the same table structure and they move it over. So what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to analyze the table structure and the design of those tables, put it into third normal form if you can, and when you do that you end up with this problem. This problem is the duplicate entries of a job title. So example, we have job code 511 and we have job code 512 and they're both programmers and they both get a job charged hours. So we could have, I have no idea what the history of the I2 database is, but we could have a third normal form database with duplicate entries perhaps. And if that were the case, we wouldn't be in BCNF format, but we would be in third normal form because we haven't cleaned it up yet. So we're going to take this to a little bit of a higher level out of third normal form and move it up a step by eliminating some common issues that are associated with it. So if we have two separate job codes with the same description, you don't make this another key. You change the concept a little bit. And how do you change the concept? Well, you put it into voice, voice cod normal form, BCNF. I always say BCNF. But this is the guy's last name. And now uh, what it is is essentially his method, and he's the one that came up with entity relationship diagramming, and he's the one actually who's based most of the normal form research, or has done most of the normal form research, and has come up with he not, not necessarily the 100% foolproof method, but one is very close in terms of using BCNF with entity relationship techniques. So every determinant in the table is a candidate key by default from his dependency research, and has some characteristics as primary key, but for some reason not chosen as a primary key, which is kind of an interesting concept. Um, so if the table contains only one candidate key, the BCNF and the third normal form are equivalent. But BCNF can be violated only if the table contains more than one candidate key. So if, for example, we introduced social security numbers or visa numbers and we put it into the student table because we want to keep track of those student IDs. We would be in third normal form but we would not be in BCNF format. But for in BCNF we only have one determinant per table, not multiple determinants. A lot of people don't want that because we can solve, we can stay in third normal form, solve the mystery of the student IDs by introducing another candidate key, your last name, your social security number, if you have one, or your visa number, another piece of information that can be used to look you up along with your student ID, because your student ID is meaningless, has no meaning to it. So that's another strategy that people take, but they're not in BCNF. Well, why do you want to be in BCNF? Well, if you're in BCNF, then you have strict rules and you're not going to put social security numbers in here, and you're going to reduce the amount of data. Because here's the other problem. The more you put into that table, the bigger the table gets, and the harder it is to navigate that table, depending on how many students you have, which is kind of the reason why they didn't do it. You can't do it with a social security number system. The database is way too big. You're going to introduce yet another piece of information, and then yet another piece of information. And then you have situations in which you have, where you have, um, multiple ways of searching with multiple different answers that you're going to get out. So if I asked you know, the database, how many students do we have? Uh, come out with a number and then search it on the other key. How many students do we have? And come out with a totally different number because some of you guys don't have social security numbers. Some of you don't have visa numbers. Or, you know, depending upon what I'm choosing, I'm, I'm de definitely going to in have inconsistent responses that are going to come out of that query. All right, so we can put it into BCNF. So most designers consider the BCNF COD form, BCNF, as a special case of third normal form. So the table is in third normal form if it's in second normal form and there are no transitive dependencies. A table is in third normal form and not in BCNF. If a transitive dependency exists when one non prime attribute is dependent on another non prime <coughs> attribute. So when we introduce, depending upon, that's why I said we could be in third, we could be in second, because when we introduce the transitive dependency to eliminate the key searching issue, we've taken it immediately out of BCNF. 
we may have taken it out of third normal form and put it into second normal form, depending upon how many and what type of dependencies we put in. If we've just introduced a transitive dependency and not just a lookup, then we're in second normal form. If we put the transitive dependency in there for, you know, be, due to a redundant key, then we might be still in third normal form, but we're certainly not in BC now. So any non-key attribute is a determinant of a key attribute is what the issue is associated with. So we have a non-key attribute that is a determinant of other non-key attributes. And this, as a special note, exists when you don't identify primary keys. If you don't have any primary keys in that table, and a lot of people don't do that. When they create the table, they leave out the foreign, the primary, they leave all that stuff out. If you don't have that in there, you're not going to be in BCNF, and most likely you're probably going to be in second normal form anyway. You're not going to make it to third normal form either, naturally. I mean, you might accidentally guess correctly and get you, but you're never going to be in BCNF after that. Okay, so here's the table that is in third normal form, but not in BCNF. And this one is using A, B, C, D. Because A and B work together, but A and B is a combination work with C and D. But then we have C that's determined on, on B. So it's a non, it's, this is not a key though, the, 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 t them together forms the composite key. So a table that is in third normal form but not in B, C, and F. So we can fix it by what are we going to break it onto another table. Long story short, we just keep dissecting it, <coughs> cutting it out into multiple tables, uh, which is what, how we're going to fix this. So here it is here. Uh, so here's the decomposition of the B, C, and F. So we have the third normal form. This is what we started with on the previous slide right here. And then we have the first normal form partial dependency that's in here. And then we have the third normal form and the BCNF over here. This is a, actually a nice little summary slide, slide number 36. And then we have the, the, we separated out the C with the B, created another table that just gives us the, the, the B that's associated with the C. And that's in third normal form and it's also in BCNF. This one is a NBCNF, and then we have the third normal form NBCNF out here. So we've taken this and we've converted it to this by breaking it out. And now what we have done is we have C here and we have C here. So instead of putting the data in the same table, we put the data in another table. So we created yet another table from this, and we've introduced more redundancy. So BCNF databases have more redundancy, but they are controlled redundancy, which is a good form of redundancy. It's kind of yes. like it's high BC. cholesterol and bad, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. <laughs> it's the balance, yeah? Is that the BCNF have more redundancy? Has more redundancy. BCNF databases are harder to navigate because there's more controlled redundancy, and it generally creates or big, makes a bigger database. Because what you've done now, and you had this that was working, and it was in third normal form, but you took it and you broke it out now, so now you have A, B, A, C, and D, and now you have, where's the C and D? C and B. C and B have, you, take, you took B out, you introduced C, so now you have multiple C's. And by redundancy, it means the data exists in multiple tables. It's redundant. So if you have student IDs in this table, and you have student IDs in this table over here, you have redundancy. But when it's used for keying, it's controlled. When it's not used for keying, it's like, as an example, addresses. If I had a student table and I had all your addresses and phone numbers and stuff in there, and then I had a registration table and I also had all of your addresses and telephone numbers in there, that's redundancy as well, but it's not controlled. Because you can call in and say, hey, I moved. Okay, and they go to the student table and they change it, and now it doesn't match what's in the registration table. Yeah, because it's in two different places and they only changed it in one place. Well, I can tell you we have redundancy because we have students who sign up for classes who don't get into the EMS because their student IDs are wrong <laughs> or because in the registration table they're not identified as the student who they're supposed to be and who their EMS account is for. So we have, I know, I, I don't even, I've never even seen this database before, by the way. I'm just guessing. Just by the problems that we have, not to complain again, but how can you have an EMS account that's different from your student account, that's different from your registration account? 
that has to be going on, which means we have a registration table, we have an EMS table, we have a student table. And there's no connection between it. We have redundancy that's going on. Because some students get access to the EMS, some students don't get access to the EMS. Some students change their email addresses in their profile, and it just doesn't get changed into the registration. It doesn't get changed, and they have the wrong email address in there. So we have to hire ma multiple people to come in to do the changes to the EMS. And then we have another group of people who do the changes in the registration office. And then we have another group of people who do. You know how expensive that is? It would be more, it would, it would make more sense to take that database and put it into third normal form BCNF. Or third normal form would work actually. And control the redundancy. So that's what's called database optimization. That's what you're doing when you're, when you get hired to make it work better. <laughs> to fix the problems. Those are the problems you're fixing. You're not buying a new software system. So half of these problems don't involve the database management system they're using. It's not an Oracle problem or a MySQL issue. It has nothing to do with the platform. It's not that it's running on a house server instead of a private server. It's not a cloud base versus a non-cloud base, which is interesting because people spend so much money from consultants who come in and sell them another database. Oh, I know what the problem is. And then they sell them the database. This is the trick. So you sell them the database, you get like 10 grand, commission on that, that sale. And then you fix the data form. When, they, when, you, when you create the new tables, then you, you, know, you put it in third normal form and you fix it all up for them. You get rid of all these problems. And then, so you really fix, but they, there was no need to sell them another database system. What they had probably would have worked. But you, know, you didn't make a sale. So. But salespeople do this all the time. So. Not that every salesperson does this, but you know, anyone who's worked in sales, you cross sale, up sale, side sale. You get whatever you can out of it because it's a cutthroat business. So, don't blame them. I mean, that's what they're doing for a living. So that's why they're good. Just as a normal, the EMS data, uh, the query for the roster. Oh no. Two, that, like you said, there's two uh, one person with two ID. Yeah. You pull them both out as a within the roster. I know. I have two IDs on a roster today. Yeah. Oh no, for EMS. Oh, for the EMS? Well, I shouldn't even tell you now. We have two separate systems as well. We have a, a EMS system, then we also have this new Genzabar thing. I don't know what this thing for the financials. So you, all your accounting is being run through a different system now, which is kind of interesting because I'm waiting to see. Well, it's manually being updated. So one system prints out reports, and the reports are taken over to another system, and they're manually entered in. I don't have to tell you anything. It doesn't have to do anything with databases, but manual entry. Just count the number of ways that could be done incorrectly. Just by, you know, wrong line, oh, wrong line, you're off by one. I mean, I've done it myself with grades on rosters. Anything done manually, not such a reliable method. Google is their best friend. Google is their best friend? Oh, the ruler is your best friend, yes. The ruler and a pen. <laughs> And a printer. Anyway, okay, I'm gonna have to stop. Otherwise, they're gonna have to. They're gonna make me fix it. <laughs> so I'm gonna stop complaining about that database. But it does lend itself as a good example. And you're not the only one that knows. I'm not the only one that knows about the problems either. So, all right. And they are fixing it. They are working on it. So there's 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 hope for the future. Hopefully, by the time you guys graduate. So. All right, so here we have the decomposition to the BCNF that we got going on here. Um, so we have this hierarchy going on. So here's the sample data for the BCNF conversion. What we've done is we've, get, we've gotten rid of the duplicates uh, in terms of the C's and the B's. So now we have a student ID, a staff ID, a class code, and then we have the, uh, the grade. This is a grading example, actually. So we have, uh, this would be the teacher for the students. And here we have the same students with two different staff IDs, with two different class codes, with two different grades. So we can keep track of all of the different um, redundancies in a controlled fashion, actually. Here's another BCNF decomposition. And this is the BCNF decomposition of this here, which is not this, um, excuse me, this is a conversion that needs to be done, by the way, not to confuse you. This is in third normal form, not in BCNF. So we could take this data as another example, convert it to BCNF by doing this. 
So here we have the student ID, the staff ID, class code, and the enrollment grade, which is what we have here. Student ID, staff ID, class enrollment, enrollment grade. Because this makes more sense than looking at A, B, C, and D. Because when you look at A, B, C, and D, you're like, what is all that stuff? So here's a better example. This is the panel B down here is third normal form and B, C, and F. This is third normal form, not B, C, and F. So we basically split it up. But you can't see by definition you're just making a new table. You have, there's a method or a reason why you're making the new table. And you're making the new table, so you're getting rid of the multiple keys that are in the original table, and the multiple dependencies, and you're making them single dependencies instead of multiple. So you've got student ID and class code that work together with the enrollment grade. So this student in this class, this student in this class got this grade. This student in that class got this grade. And then the class code with the staff ID. Because otherwise, what you might end up having in here is a class code for an entry. You might have a class code with a different staff ID. That I've never seen here, actually. Well, usually one teacher is assigned to a class code. And maybe we just don't have an, a, a, that many teachers. I don't know. <laughs> and usually you don't have records. I've never seen a trans. Well, actually, they don't put it on the transcript. So I wouldn't know. But usually, actually, they don't put it on your grades either. We might actually have that problem, but who knows? When you're signed up for the EMS, we only have one class. And the class has a TA and it has a teacher assigned to it. We do have, actually, we do have cases in which we have classes in the EMS that have the wrong teacher assigned to it and the wrong TAs. That problem does exist, actually. Uh, or multiple sections with the same teacher, even though different people are teaching it. Like a weekend versus a weekday, but it's the same. Because you know what they do is they take those classes and they recycle the format. And the format starts out with the, unless it gets changed, it starts out with the old information, I believe. Or That's how the old system used to work. I think they recently changed that, though, to make it different. But anyway, long story short, you could possibly have... A student ID with a class code with a different teacher, with a different staff ID that's associated with it. And this is for, uh, probably should have said teacher ID or staff ID or TA ID. So you could have different students with different TAs that are assigned for the same class that are inconsistent. Um, so that problem would exist if you were not in BCNF format. So you would want to go into BCNF format to get rid of that type of situation to prevent it from occurring. So it may not be a bad idea to put something into BCNF just so that you can have consistency for that. So normalization and database design. Um, so the normalization itself should be part of the design process. This, these particular examples I've given you have been working the opposite direction. Because unless you're working on a brand new project, you're not going to be starting out with entity relationship diagrams. So instead what you're doing is the same concept, but you're working in a reverse order. So we started out with a spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet was like the first normal form. And we converted that all the way up to BCNF going through it. If you took the different approach to it and you didn't have anything built at all, you didn't have that spreadsheet to start out with or that crap that they gave you when you signed up to do this job, then you do the entity relationship model and you take that from the start. But you can work it backwards, as we've seen, by going through normal forms. So normal forms and normalization is the opposite of entity relationship diagramming. It's doing it in reverse order. So they call it normalization, and they don't call entity relationship diagramming anything. They call it database design. So instead of designing it from the start, you're taking and you're redesigning it in reverse order, re-engineering it from reverse order, which is the same concept you get in software engineering. All right. So in theory, it should be part of the design process. So once you've got your tables out, before you do any implementation at all, you can take a look at that and basically try to improve it, put it into BCNF or put it into third normal form before you create and populate any of that data. Make sure that the proposed entities meet the required normal form before the table structures are created. Many real-world databases have been improperly designed or burdened with anomalies if improperly modified during the course of time. As an example, someone in 2012 decides, hey, we need to add this piece of information. All the other records prior to 2012 don't have that information in them. 
that's another problem that comes up, and that puts you, believe it or not, into first, could actually make your table structure, put it back into first normal form. Because now you've introduced a new field, a new attribute that might change a key, may also change, well, it's going to definitely introduce groupings. Uh, and then you're going to end up with a situation in which you've got uh, nulls, no values or zeros or something. So you can actually take your beautiful third normal. So here's the other scenario. Instead of being hired to come in to work and to redesign this database, you just graduated from IT, you've never worked on databases before, and they hire you to come in to be the DBA. And then you take the beautiful third normal, now none of you guys are going to do this, but you take the beautiful third normal form database that's in BCNF and you put it into a first normal form by tweaking it. <laughs> because somebody over in the application department, website team, said, hey, we need to keep track of this too. And we need to keep track of this data, and we need to keep track of that data, and the database isn't doing it. Can you do it for me? And you went and opened up the table, and oh, let's just modify the table. Update the structure, put this column in here, and put this column over here, and then you've taken a beautiful design, and you've put it back into first normal form. Happens all the, ha all the time with software, actually. So the more you maintain a piece of software, the worse it becomes, it decays and it dies. It's kind of like the house example. If you, you know, you go out and you get an architectural design for a house and you build it, it's perfect. It's sound. It's architecturally sound. It passes permits and stuff, everything. You take and you do like what the Winchester Mystery House does, if you guys are familiar with that one. Down the, yeah, just add, just keep adding stuff. You know, oh, let's just take out that wall. Let's just put another, put another story on this thing. Per, eventually, that house is going to fall down, or it's going to have to be retrofitted for something because it's missing support beams, or it's got way too much weight on the ceiling, or you know the foundation was small and then now it's wider. The house is bigger than the foundation now, and you've ruined the integrity of the entire structure. That has a higher likelihood of falling down than one you just was built from a sound design. So, same thing with the database is what I'm trying to say. Uh, so many real-world problems can be uh, solved by uh, and the database itself is uh, burdened by what happens to it. And you may be asked to redesign and modify existing databases instead of just building one. So normalization and database design itself starts out with the ER diagram, as we've seen in the first weekend, and provides a big picture or the macro view of the organizational stage requirements and operations. That's why it's so important to get a good database a design before you even start implementing it. Um, it's kind of like writing an outline to a paper. Entity relationship diagram is sort of a must. So I uh, create it through an iterative process as well. Check the design, populate it full of data, sample data. This is the other thing people don't do. They say, oh yeah, here's the design. Okay. And then they build it and then they populate it, but they never test it. They never, you know, go through and say, well, we'll put five, five records in each one of the tables and let's run the queries. Instead, they wait and populate the whole thing, pull all the data, and then they run the queries and go, oh, let's just add another table. And then they try to fix it. Instead of taking it all down, dumping all the data out, rebuilding the design, they patch it. Yeah, they add new tables and new keys and stuff to try to fix it when there's a problem with the fundamental design. That's how, like, you get recalls on cars and stuff. You know, that, oh, we forgot about this. Okay, just put this part in here. Oh, put that part in here, too. It's like when you repair something. You're putting in stuff that wasn't there originally or something. You're modifying it. You're ruining the design completely. Uh, so it's better to actually do it iteratively and uh, recheck things and populate it and test it before you put it out into production. And identify uh, relative entities, relationships, and attributes, and then use the results to identify additional entities and relationships and attributes that might exist as well. So that was everything you ever wanted to know about database normalization and everything that you'll probably end up doing if you ever get a job and working with databases. In fact, these are really the common source of most problems that happen with databases because they don't hire database people to build databases. <laughs> they hire, oh, Bob, over in accounting, can you put a database together for us? Yeah, we bought Oracle. Here it is. It works. When you're looking at it, you're going, uh, what? You're not a trained database person. You're just Bob working in accounting. They just pull out Excel spreadsheets and say this is my R database. Or, yeah, that's what they do. Actually, that's what you get when you get IT tech wannabe who, oh, yeah, I want to learn about databases. Yeah, okay. 
I'll put a database together for you. No problem. And then you get the Excel spreadsheet that's converted into a database in first normal form. Or better yet, they just flip a coin and they start making tables. And then you get first normal form out of that, usually. If you flip a coin and decide on your table structure by chance or luck, you know, luck of the draw, actually you could probably do cards for it too. And then just build some tables. You're guaranteed to get into first normal form eventually. It's just not going to be very functional past that. So. Okay, so now that I've talked about normalization, I can talk about this assignment here. And the assignment is number five, and it's one is due that you'll have some time after lunch to work on. So uh, we're going to, I don't know what time it is right now. It is 11.32, so in about 15 minutes or so, we're going to break for lunch. And uh, I know it seems kind of early. Maybe it's because we had a late start. But anyway, long story short, I'm going to give you some time in the afternoon to work on this little piece here. If you know what you're doing, it takes you five minutes. Actually, I could probably do it for you right now in five minutes. It's not a hard assignment. However, you're probably not going to absorb everything I just said about normalization in the next five minutes and then also do the assignment at the same time. So you're probably going to need to dwell on it a little bit, which is kind of like how I, I sort of like having it like after lunch because then you can think about it a little bit and then revisit the concepts. You're probably going to have to think about this a little bit. It's not hard, though. It's actually pretty easy. So what are we looking at? For this assignment, you're going to need to analyze a table-based design, a table design, to normalize the table below, and I'm going to give you the table in a few minutes, to achieve a design where all the tables are in third normal form. And then you're going to create a functional dependency description for all of the new tables that are created. I'm going to show you how to do that in a few minutes. And you're going to create a simple table description for the final tables. So there's this thing called a functional description. We actually saw it in the lecture. It was number 6B, I believe. Um, and uh, what we're looking at here is a little note. The functional dependency description should be listed like this. Functional dependencies are your dependencies. Remember? Dependencies. We have partial, we have transitive, and we have full. Fulls are what we want. We don't want partial, we don't want transitive. We document the dependencies this way. So column A depends on, and we have the relationship with column B, column C, and column D. We can use the column names. This is an example. It just doesn't have a name to it, just column A, column B, column C. We could put, you know, student ID, and then we have name, address, phone number, um, date of birth, you know, everything associated with the student. It's associated with, functionally depends. This data functionally depends on the student ID. Or we can do this and go A and comma B or A comma D depends on E comma F. If we have that, we have a transitive dependency or we might have a partial dependency or we might have a full dependency depending upon what A, B, C, and D are actually. We're certainly not in B, C, and F and you don't have to worry about B, C, and F actually for this exercise. There's no, just the third normal form. If you want to take it a step further, you can try it out in BCNF, but I believe you're going to be in BCNF automatically if you get the solution correct. So also note here on the simple table descriptions. So this is how you're doing the functional dependency descriptions, and you're doing both. You're doing a functional dependency description, and you're doing a table description for each one of the tables that you're going to normalize this list down here with. So what you got? Uh, so for a simple table description, you can go table A, column A, comma, column B, comma, column C, comma, column D, foreign key, column E. So it's kind of like this is going to be the foreign key, and column E, here's the foreign key, which references table D. So if you're putting in the primary keys, hopefully, you're underlining them. So this is a primary key that's underlined. The foreign key, if you were to create this table, you'd want a reference. And the reference here is going to be column E. So you're identifying the foreign keys. And you're saying it references table D, which means that's the table that column E is located in. Obviously, this is going to make more sense when you put actual column names in there. So. It's actually table A, and then column A is the primary key that's underlined. So you're underlining the primary keys, and then you're referencing 
after you've broken out the data into all these different tables, you're going to put the key structure together. And the key structure, the primary key here, is going to reference a foreign key. You're just indicating which foreign key it's referencing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I want, to, want you to put in the references. Otherwise, if you go primary key, foreign key, primary key, foreign key, and, and like, look at that. Is that a primary? Is that a foreign? You know, it's really hard to tell it. So this is actually a better way of documenting, and it's more standard in the industry to kind of see it referenced correctly so you know which table that primary key came out of that's now being used as a reference that's a foreign key. All right, so given the table name and the list of columns that compose the table, there's no data in this table, by the way. There's just a table with a list of columns. So you designate the primary key by underlining the column names. So primary key is underlined here. And designate the foreign key by listing them beneath the table description as demonstrated here. Use this format. So you're doing two things. For each one of the tables, you're doing this, giving me the functional dependency, and then you're also giving me a description. As indicated up here, create a functional dependency and then create a simple table description. So you're doing these two parts for, what are you doing it for? So you're doing it for the tables that you're going to create. So you're given here the problem description. So you're given the following database table. This is a single table called customer order table. Normalize the table and design the database to be in a third normal form. Create the functional dependency descriptions for all new tables created. Create simple table based table des descriptions for the final tables. So here's your table. Your table is customer order table, has customer ID, has customer first name, customer last name. Use these if you want. You have the freedom to change the names if you want. Especially if you want to indicate foreign and private keys, foreign and uh, primary keys, et cetera, and so forth. But what you're doing is you're taking, this is all one table, by the way. Break it out into multiple tables, normal. I put this, this is first normal form. Then you don't need any data in here to do this. So take this, put it into third normal form for each one of the tables that result from this process. Give me these two items in this format. So I want you to identify the dependencies because it double checks your design and then give me the foreign and then the primary keys like this. Questions? So we can choose from the primary keys? You'll have to. You'll, you're you're going to have to because we don't have any. There's no primary keys in this table. It's it's This is a spreadsheet. <laughs> this is the customer order table you know, someone took a list, a spreadsheet, all the stuff everybody ordered from this company and put it into a spreadsheet and called it the database. <laughs> and you got hired on it to fix this problem. Yeah? Believe it or not, there's only one. There's one normal, there's a third normal form that's going to come out of this. There might be some that are in B, C, and F. There might be some that are in second normal form and didn't make it to third normal form. But what if you have a third normal form, you're right. You might change. So there, there might be some variations. You're correct. Not everyone's going to come up with the same identical list of tables. The names of the tables are going to be different. I mean, we have one table. You're probably going to have to make more tables, which means you're going to have to decide, well, what are we going to call this table? So I'm going to call it customer orders. No, I'm going to call it orders for customers. No, I'm going to call it OC. You know, you're going to come up with different names. You're also going to come up with different names unless if you change these. You do, I said you had the freedom to change it if you want to. Keep this list, but if you don't like customer ID because it doesn't match, is there a customer ID? I don't know. Order ID. Actually, this is pretty consistent. Order date. You can call it O date if you want. You don't necessarily have to keep the same naming convention, especially if it doesn't make sense. Like. You know, customer address one, customer address two. Do you really need to call it cust a custom street address? Especially if it's in a customer file, a customer table. It's probably going to be address one, address two, or something. You can abbreviate the names if you want. Um, if they have the freedom to kind of tweak it to modify the naming conventions and stuff if you'd like. So, in fact, you know, this is probably going to be more of a composite key, if anything because it's going to be the address, and the address is going to have 
line number one, line number two, <laughs> and it's going to have city, state, and zip. It's all associated with an address. That's a composite key, actually. And I better stop talking about this, otherwise I'm going to give you the design. So, uh, but that's the assignment you're going to work on after lunch. And so I'm going to turn off this recording right now. See, I'm about 11:45. It's good.